welcome to HistFest 2021. My name's Rebecca Adil and I'm the director of HistFest and I'm so very excited to share this weekend's events with you. We have a fantastic assortment of talks and discussions coming up, so please do check out everything else that's going on via the website www.histfest.org. Before we get started, on behalf of HistFest and the British Library, I'd like to acknowledge the passing of His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh and pay tribute to his long public service. Now, before we get on with the first event, there are just a couple of points of housekeeping to note. Using the menu above, you can provide feedback on the event and also, if you wish, donate to the British Library. The library is a charity and your support really does help to open up a world of knowledge and inspiration to everyone. Your feedback is also incredibly important in helping the library plan future cultural events. There you will also find a tab with a link to the bookshop where you can browse a range of titles by the festival's many speakers. At the end of the discussion, there'll be a short audience Q&A. Please do submit your questions using the box below the video. Also below the video are social media links should you wish to continue the conversation on different platforms afterwards. Without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to today's sponsors to introduce you to the panellists for Artemisia, Mistress of Blood. Hello, I'm Alexandra Whitaker, the PR manager at Fellows Auctioneers. Fellows is one of the UK's most established auction houses with a focus on luxury watches, designer brands and unique pieces of jewellery. We're delighted to support Artemisia, Mistress of Blood, featuring art historian and presenter of the BBC's Britain's Lost Masterpieces, Dr Bender Grosvenor, historian and author of The Beauty and the Terror, Dr Catherine Fletcher, and art historian and host of the Art Matters podcast, Farron Gibson. Enjoy. for joining us for our discussion of Artemisia Gentileschi's life and amazing work. She was a formidable artist at a time when it was not easy for women to train as an artist, let alone reach her level of incredible success. I do want to note that as we go into Gentileschi's story, we will be discussing an instance of rape, so I'd like to flag that as sensitive material right now. Um, my name is Baron Gibson. I'm an art historian and your inquisitive hostess for this event. I'm joined by Catherine Fletcher, Professor of History at Manchester Metropolitan University. She is an author of several fascinating books, including her most recent book, The Beauty and the Terror, An Alternative History to the Italian Renaissance. We're also joined by Bender Grosvenor, an art historian, broadcaster, and a downright detective when it comes to uncovering lost masterpieces. He also curated the Bright Souls exhibition in 2019, which was the first UK exhibition on Britain's 17th century women artists. This evening, we're going to look at a few of Gentileschi's works and see what they can reveal about her life and painting style and life in Italy at that time. Please be sure to send through any questions you have as we discuss and we'll have a look at some of those towards the end. So let's begin with our first image. Um, it is her allegory of painting, which is believed to be a self-portrait. Uh, Catherine, maybe you could set the scene for us a bit by telling us about Gentileschi's early life. Yeah, well, this painting is actually from quite late in her career when she was at the English court um, in the 1630s. Um, but we have to go back really four decades to her birth in 1593 in Rome into a family already um, very much involved in the Baroque art scene. Um, her father, Orazio Gentileschi, was actually a court painter in England at the time of that, um, that particular work that we've just seen. Um, so Artemisia was born into a family of artists, which, of course, is one of the classic ways that the the women artists of this period get their training. It's actually very relatively uncommon for women to go out of the household to train as an artist as men would do. So Artemisia comes in with some advantages and already in her teens, she is creating extraordinary work. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about one of her first um, paintings. It's a Susanna and the Elders. Um, Susanna and the Elders is a really popular subject um, for biblical paintings at this time. It shows the virtuous young Susanna in in her bath being spied on by two lecherous old men, the elders. And most versions of Susanna and the elders show Susanna either completely oblivious to what these old guys are doing or even perhaps slightly enjoying it. Artemisia completely changes that and she paints Susanna who is traumatized and horrified at these old men and, and she's only 17. 
Um, so it's an extraordinary start to the to the career of this um, this teenage artist. But it it very very quickly um, her life takes quite an unpleasant turn. First of all, there is some very nasty rumor and gossip about the fact that perhaps she had been modeling nude in front of an audience and um, prompted by her father. Um, you know, she, of course, says that that is not true. It's a scurrilous rumor and um, it's very important for women in this period to maintain a, um, the reputation of being chaste. Um, and then um, things get even worse when in um, 1611, she is assaulted by one of her tutors, Agostino Tassi, a man who has been brought into the household to teach her the, the complex process of trompe l'oeil painting, the kind of painting that you do on ceilings to give a three-dimensional effect. Um, instead of taking his job seriously, what he does is he takes advantage of his position um, and he rapes um, the young Artemisia and then tells her that he's going to marry her and goes on to sexually exploit her over an extended period. Um, there's some fairly horrific testimony, which um, I'm not necessarily going to go into in detail at this point. Um, but eventually, after some months, um, Artemisia's father um, put, get, reports him and the rapist is put on trial. And in this period, this is a trial basically of between these two men, between the father, whose property, his daughter, has been devalued because she's no longer a virgin, and the rapist. And it almost becomes a trial of Artemisia herself because she is questioned under torture about what had happened. Um, they they use thumb screws as a method of torture, which is fairly um, horrific. She gives her test, but she insists that she was forced into it, um, that she actually tried to defend herself with a knife, um, that she wanted to kill him. Um, and in the end, um, after some further testimony from a witness about the very, very dubious past of Tassie, who had previously tried to have his wife murdered, um, Tassie is found guilty. I mean, it, it's a horrific and traumatic um, trial and one that um, has often been seen as very key to understanding um, Artemisia's life and certain of her works, which we will come on to, as we will see, she um, paints some very, very powerful women. And we see even in those very early instances that she is absolutely sure about defending herself and defending her reputation when she is, you know, effectively um, put on trial by the legal system. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering now, I was thinking we should talk about allegory of painting um, first, just because it's possibly a self paint a self portrait but now i'm wondering if what you've just explained would be a good way of going into judith and hall of furnace in terms of um how critics and historians have often connected the events of her life to some of the imagery that she did in the time that she lived in florence just after the trial so do you guys think it might be good to go into judith and hall of furnace perhaps right now and we can come back to the other well, uh, sorry. I'm just I think while we've got while we've got the allegory of painting up, can I just say something about it? Because I think it's, although Catherine rightly said it's not an early work from from the beginning of her life that we we're, mm -hmm. we're talking about now, um, it does it does encapsulate her very distinctive approach to painting. So um, we don't know exactly the circumstances in which this self portrait um, came to be, or indeed even. Uh, when it was painted, it, it, it's worth pointing out at this early stage in the discussion, there's so much about Artemisia Gentileschi's life that we don't unfortunately know. And I'm not saying that as a sort of get out of jail free card for when I, <laughs> when I get things wrong um, in this discussion. But un unfortunately, for reasons we'll go into, there's so much we don't know about her life. But this this painting, this wonderful self-portrait, this wonderful allegory of, of painting, um, is recorded in the collection of King Charles I in the 1630s, um, when she comes to London briefly. Um, it seems not to be recorded as a self-portrait. And, and it's interesting how, although it, it almost certainly is is her in a sense, or certainly her features model on her in the painting, it's it's interesting how it wasn't regarded as a conventional self-portrait. And, and it just tells us so much about how, how differently she approached topics like this throughout her career. And what that's what makes her such an exciting artist. Um, she, she is, uh, as you can see, she's sort of rather acrobatically approaching the canvas with, with a brush in her hand. She's sort of really ready to do battle with the canvas in front of her and a palette in the other hand. And that's so different uh, from conventional uh, male artist self-portraits of the period. 
Um, in fact, very often in male self-portraits, um, you don't even see the artist with, with a paintbrush in their hand or a palette. Um, they're so often trying to present themselves as not artists, but sort of, you know, members of the gentry or even courtiers or noblemen. Uh, we might, for example, think in this country, uh, quite a well-known self-portrait from about the same time is Sir Anthony Van Dyke's self-portrait, which is in the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and there, there again, he's, he's dressed in his finery. There's no hint of a brush. Uh, Rubens is the same with his, his gold chain on. That's also in the Royal Collection. So, so Artemisia, uh, she's demonstrating that she does things differently. Uh, and it's possible that this portrait uh, was sort of sent ahead of her as a, as a calling card, if you like, sort of an element of marketing to the king. And that helped um, establish some patronage for her when she got here. Well, it's interesting too, the name of it um, as allegory of painting, because there's so many paintings at this time that are allegory for this and that spring or ideas, abstract ideas like um, design and drawing and things. So for her to potentially, if this is in fact a self-portrait, show herself um, as, as the allegory for painting, that's really interesting and quite bold actually. <laughs> And it's a particularly gendered thing because the allegory of painting is a female. I mean, the muses, the artistic muses are always female, but a lot of the time they're being painted as these idealized women by male artists. And so to have a woman painting a female allegory of painting is, it, is in itself a kind of interesting play on some of the gender politics of the time. Yeah. And something only a woman could do in that, um, as you said, often allegories are shown as women. So she's uniquely able to do that, which is quite fun, actually. Um, so this was done, uh, she had, well, maybe we should come back to that in terms of the chronology, because she spends a little bit of time in, uh, in England, I think a bit later. But um, so after the trial, uh, she does get married. Uh, and she moves to Florence and has a kind of Florentine phase, if you will. So can, can we maybe look at the second image um, or have that queued up as we talk about her time in Florence and uh, Judith, Judith and Holofernes? Um, so Catherine, maybe you can kick off with, uh, with what life was like at that time. Yeah, I mean, she gets married off after the trial to um, somebody who is probably a relative, um, has the same surname as one of the key witnesses, and he's a citizen of Florence. So Italy at this point is not all one country, it's divided into different states, and the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, um, which has Florence as its capital, is a very nice place to be indeed if you're an artist, because the Grand Duke Cosmo II is... Um, keen to commission paintings and um, so that's good it's also got a great intellectual scene so um, Michelangelo's nephew is there um, putting together a house to um, commemorate his famous uncle so Artemisia gets a commission to um, paint another allegory allegory of inclination um, for the Casa Buonarroti and she also gets to know people like Galileo um, who is also at the court at this time, just has just published his treatise, The Starry Messenger. She becomes a member of the Florentine Academy, um, the Academy of um, Art and Design. Um, and that's quite extraordinary um, for a woman in Florence in that period. She's the first woman to join the Florentine Academy. So again, it's a real kind of breakthrough move for women artists in that particular part of Italy. Um, she's also having children. I mean, this is a working mother. She has at least four, probably five children during these years in Florence um, and is combining that with this huge amount of output with, um, you know, trying to cultivate patrons as well, because you need to convince these very well off people that they want to commission you you need to dress up nicely and go and I don't, play the game at court and um, there's one instance where she turns up and and she plays the lute at a fancy dress party and there are actually a number of lute players that she paints again so I think at least one of those is speculated to be a self-portrait I mean lots of people like to say that all the Artemisia works are self-portraits one way or the other and I think we there's perhaps a little too much of that going on sometimes um but it's, it's a fascinating world um she and and it's one in which she paints um, this this very very dramatic um, Judith and Holofernes that we've we've just seen. So this is a it's a biblical story um, like Susanna and the Elders, um, but it's an incredible take on um, 
that particular story. So there are, there are the number of treatments of this work um, going right back to, well, I mean, Donatello, I think um, this is Judith by Donatello. Um, there's in, in Florence, there's quite a tradition of it. Um, and here though, we have a painting that really shows the kind of the power and the struggle of these women to subdue this man and cut his head off. Um, it's an earlier version by Caravaggio in which there's a kind of rather sort of polite um, use of a sword to um, neatly slice the chap's head off. There's none of that going on here. She's really got this mm. sense of the, the muscle that's needed to, to, to cut a guy's head off. And often um, artists um, show maybe before or after the events has happened, don't they? So <laughs> she's really showing us the gore of, of what's going on here. Maybe Bender, you can talk a bit about what's happening in the scene and maybe a bit about the story as well, uh, just in case uh, people watching don't know about the story. So sure, Judith and Holofernes um, is an Old Testament tale and Judith was uh, an, an Israelite heroine uh, because uh, Holofernes is the general of the advancing uh, invading a Syrian army at one point um, and uh, she decides that she's going to save the day by um, she's Judith is actually a widow so she decides to put on her very best clothes um, and take out some uh, some treats to go and um, basically the, the word in the Bible is delight now lots of people have thought that means sort of seduce but it probably just means tempt with all sorts of lovely treats and most importantly lots of wine too so Holofernes mm. um, <laughs> becomes drunk and uh, lies down on his bed as we see here to go to sleep and that is when uh, Holofernes pounces um, and chops his head off and takes the head back to the Israelite uh, camp, sticks it on the barricades, and the Assyrian army see this the next morning, and they flee in terror, and um, Judas saves the day. So um, what's uh, it's very interesting that Catherine mentioned uh, Caravaggio's painting of this, which is uh, about 1600, so we're talking ab ab about 15 years earlier, um, and that painting is in Rome. Should, uh, uh, Artemisia may have seen it, but we can't be absolutely sure, but this the, the treatment of the light here, and we may discuss that later on, is 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 very Caravaggio-esque. But um, in Caravaggio's painting, uh, the slicing of the head is not particularly convincing. Um, it seems Caravaggio was sort of more interested in, in portraying Judith as this sort of lovely model who's rather um, delicately sort of uh, wafting a sword over the neck and, and unconvincingly blood gushes out. Um, but what, what I think is so exciting about Artemisia's uh, representation here um, is that she she's really thought about what it would be like the sort of pose and and form you'd have to get into to slice a fellow's head off um, and in the, in the bible uh, we know that um, it took two goes with the sword to to hack it off um, so they were quite brutal blows and what i think uh, we see here with judith she's she's grabbing the head very convincingly in one hand and the the sword is coming out and she sort of you can see all the effort in her arms and her shoulders. And, and quite interesting too, that uh, you can see she's almost recoiling from the blood. She's got her very finest clothes on um, and she's, she may be concerned about the blood going on her, her dress. And uh, this picture, the, the one we've got on the screen at the moment, she painted this scene um, as with a number of her compositions. She, she, she repeated them. She seems to have been quite the businesswoman. If she had a hit, she did it again. Mm -hmm. The painting we've got on the screen is actually the second version um, the first one she painted uh, in, it, it, shortly after the, the trial uh, and the rape. Um, and in this one we see here, it's, it's bigger. This one is in Florence in the Uffizi. It was painted for the Medicis. Um, and there is extra gore. That's the really interesting thing. There's much more blood in this one. Uh, otherwise, the composition is pretty identical. Um, and it, it appears that the, the blood is spurting towards Judith in, in quite a precise manner. And it's been pointed out that this matches uh, her friend Galileo's theory of the parabolic projection of, of liquids like this. So, so that may be a nod to her friendship with Galileo. Um, and one other, the, my last point about um, how I think uh, Artemisia sort of reinvents this, this pose and gives it a particularly... A distinctive female uh, approach um, is that is the presence of the maid. So um, in the Bible, the maid does not uh, take part in the killing. Um, she's she's given a name subsequently in the in the sort of uh, in the literature. She's called Abra, uh, and generally artists portray her either sort of off camera, 
uh, ready to, to, to take the head away, um, or she's sort of cowering in the corner, not quite sure what to do. But here, Artemisia absolutely makes her party to the killing. She's holding um, Holofernes down. So, so they're both at it. And uh, Catherine's quite right to say that it, sometimes it's, it's a little bit too tempting to see Artemisia's own physiognomy in these various figures. But I don't know. It's, it's probable that we see her here. And, and it may even be, uh, because the two figures look quite alike, it may even be that we sort of see the same person twice. Well, I wonder, and we're going to come back to discussing um, models and how difficult it was to have models uh, for, for a woman artist at that time. So I wonder if that's a factor. But I think what's interesting is that um, Judith looks quite heroic in my point of view in this painting. And I think that with a lot of Baroque art at this time, um, the, the idea is that the church is trying to get artists to create this very dramatic edifying art of biblical themes, classical themes, um, as, a, as a sort of instructive mor moral tool for morality. Um, and so oftentimes I feel like male artists um, might show Judith or Delilah and Samson as a sort of um, warning about um, what women can do to you if you give in to their you know, give into desire and all of these things. And she's showing this from a totally different perspective of the woman as a hero and um, taking charge, which I think is quite interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, and as, as Catherine did mention, the this this topic was quite favored by the Medici. Um, it's it sort of symbolized um, the smaller the smaller force overcoming the bigger one. And of course, as Catherine said, Italy at the time was a, a series of small states and the Medici's often managed to, to punch above their, their weight. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it is perhaps worth, um, I mean, a lot of people uh, emphasize um, Artemisia's uh, input into this painting was, was a kind of a reaction to, to the rape by Agostino Tassi. Uh, but it is also worth, and I, I think sometimes that overshadows our, our understanding of, of how she worked, but it is also worth mentioning the, the, the paradoxical role, of, of position of women in, in society at this time. There were so many things they couldn't do, uh, but uh, occasionally because of the sort of, um, you know, the, uh, the aristocratic structure of societies, occasionally um, women uh, did have absolute power and could be very strong women. So there, there was a sort of celebration of strong women like this. And the Old Testament gave you many examples uh, with which to draw on. Um, the Medicis, of course, had their own examples in the family. Uh, Marie de Medici is at this time, um, for much of this period, she's effectively uh, ruling France herself. Um, and uh, so, so they tap into that. And it's worth mentioning also that Judith was a very common name. So um, I think Shakespeare calls his two daughters, Susanna and Judith. And we've, we've mentioned both stories already. So um, that, that's part of the sort of paradoxical position of, of women in society at the time. You, you were supposed to be a strong woman, but in so many ways you couldn't be. Mm. Yes, because in, in Florence itself, you also have the duchesses and the, the daughters of the, the Grand Duke and Duchess of Florence. So you have a whole court society in which women are able to play particular roles. In a way, you, you don't quite have the same thing in Rome because at the papal court, it's it's men and it is often sometimes men and their mistresses and there's the Roman nobility but they're not quite on an even level with the Pope and the Cardinals. So the dynamics of Florence um, at this point as a city for intellectual women um, are probably relatively more welcoming for all that in Rome, I mean, yeah, um, Urban VIII does allow women to join the Roman Academy. Perhaps it's, it's not quite the same social dynamics as at a court where you have a Grand Duchess and where you have, um, you know, Medici women marrying across European royalty, making all those connections across the continent. Um, nor is it the same, we'll see a little bit later, she goes to Naples. And again, in Naples, you've got a viceroy, you have the Spanish nobility, you have um, Spanish noble women there, very present, very much in a court society where women, yeah, they have to play set particular roles, but they're able to operate. Of course, one of the ways that Artemisia operates in Florence um, in this court society is that she has a, an affair with a nobleman um, called a Meringhi with the knowledge of her husband. Um, and he is quite a significant patron for them. 
Um, and for a while, it seems to go quite well, but it eventually becomes a source of scandal. So again, these sort of the, the, the kind of sexual games that are played around court society are mm -hmm. a little bit two edged in some ways. On the one hand, they might bring a female artist patronage. On the other hand, if it just gets all a little bit too much, um, it might be easier to get out of town. And in fact, that is what um, Artemisia ends up doing. She um, ends up with a legal separation from her husband and um, starts to do her own thing. Um, so, okay. yeah, very, before, very different circumstances. Before we leave uh, Florence uh, in our story, <laughs> I guess, and, and move on to a next painting and kind of phase in her life, I did just want to clarify one thing, um, and I hope everyone's sending through questions as, as and when you have them who's watching. Um, we keep saying, oh, it's like Caravaggio, or it's Caravaggio-esque. Um, and I thought it might be good to clarify what are some of the visual elements we're talking about, maybe in terms of tenebrism or that drama. Um, and the Judith and Holofernes is a really good example of that, I think. So, um, Bender, maybe you can point out some of those um, that classic Baroque drama and, and what makes it like a Caravaggio. <laughs> Uh, yes, very good point, Vern. Thank you. Um, so Caravaggio, um, he's uh, one of the great geniuses of Italian painting, um, and he uh, essentially has one great idea, and it really is a great one, and that is to uh, light his pictures a little bit like a sort of dramatic stage set. Uh, and he does this by introducing a single light source. Um, uh, one of the most famous examples is um, a chapel in Rome, uh, and I should remember the name of it because I was making a film there uh, before the pandemic started, but it's just temporarily left my <laughs> my brain. Um, it's the story of St. Matthew. Um, and he, he, lights, he lights the paintings as if they were lit only from the single window in the chapel. And when you do that in a painting, it... it instantly creates much more drama amongst the characters because you get this uh, this great interplay of light and dark and as you as you mentioned it's called um tenebrism the italian for that contrast tenebroso so we call it uh, tenebrism um and uh, that 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 idea was a was an instant hit in italian art uh, and artemisia's dad through through her through whom she studied uh, so much at the beginning of her career um he was a great friend of caravaggio um, and saw lots of his work. So, so uh, Artemisia um, adapts this idea, um, and I think you could you could position Artemisia. I mean, for example, in in the picture we've had on the screen, there is the single light source coming from the, the top left hand side, uh, and, mm -hmm. it, and it casts a dramatic light over the over the whole thing. And and it's and it allows you to play as an artist with so many lovely details, particularly the um, the shadow of the blood uh, and the way that the light catches the folds of the various bits of drapery. Now, I think you can make, a, it'd be interesting to see what Catherine says about this, you can make a convincing case, actually, uh, that um, Artemisia, for, despite the fact that she was forgotten for so much of art history, actually, she's, she's the sort of, um, the true heir, the best heir of Caravaggio, that next generation after Caravaggio dies, because uh, not only can she do that fantastic light source trick and make all her paintings so dramatic, um, but in in bringing so much more convincing human presence and emotion to so many of these subjects uh, like Judith and Holofernes, that, that, that female view, she actually enhances the drama in a way that Caravaggio couldn't do. We, we mentioned Caravaggio's own rendering of uh, Judith and Holofernes. As, as Catherine said, uh, Judith looks like a, a model that's slightly uncomfortably brought in and never wielded a sword in her life. Uh, and that, that often holds back Caravaggio's pictures but it doesn't with Artemisia. No, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that for quite a long time, I mean, right since the end of the 19th century, when she started to be rediscovered, Artemisia was treated as a little bit of a novelty. It was, oh gosh, a woman who can paint, how amazing. And so much of the early sort of rediscovery of her was around the fact that, oh gosh, she's a woman. Oh gosh, she had this terribly exciting, if traumatic, life story. And it was very, very focused on a biography. And the painting, the actual quality of the painting got slightly dropped out of the story. And I think it's only very, very recently that people have started saying, look, yes, some of that, um, what, what she adds to um, the, those sort of genre paintings, the, the, the paintings of the biblical subjects, the well-known subjects, comes out of the fact that she's a woman and has had particular experiences. But that it's not all about you know her sex it's also about the fact that 
um, you know, she she was moving um, the whole art world forward with that work. Mm. And, you know, that that is something that I think is just about coming, is, is just about emphasised um, now, but really even going back 20 or 30 years, it was still very much about the biography. So I, I want you, um, because we've got another 10 minutes before we go to questions, because time really does fly. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to talk about what, another painting, um, if we can. So I'm, I'm quickly changing ta uh, stories here. Um, and I want to look at our third painting, which is Venus and Cupid. It's quite different from what we were just talking about and an opportunity for us to go into a few other um, challenges that she experienced, perhaps. Um, as a woman artist and with something as simple as where do you find models when you're doing a painting of a nude woman or a, a nude man? I don't know if she did nude men actually, but um, where do you find these models? <laughs> um, so she left Florence, as you said, and she went to Rome and then Venice in, the, in that next decade. And um, if we could pull up Venus and Cupid, um, I'd love to talk a bit about what's happening in this scene. And uh, yeah, some of, some of those challenges I just mentioned. One thing I love about this painting, as we'll see shortly, is that it, um, to me, it has like a kind of secret landscape painting in the background. It's, she, she shows a window to the back and you can see the greenery to the back. And I think it's just a cheeky little landscape that she inserts in there, which is quite fun. I think one of the extraordinary things about her, just while we're waiting for the image, is the fact that she, um, she learns all this um, classical literature um, she is really able to pick up on the references and she has gone from somebody who um, when in her teens at the point of the trial was describing herself as barely literate she could just about read a letter and suddenly by you know less than a decade later she has um, got the knowledge got the expertise got the literacy to participate in the very very intellectual circles of the Florentine Academy and that's quite an extraordinary learning curve um, and so she you know she starts painting these classical subjects which alongside the religious subjects are the, the, the kind of the, those two are the bread and butter of Baroque art really and um, they and and she not only does the Venus and Cupid she also does um, Cariska and the satire, which um, ties into some um, work by women writers of the period. Ah, oh, we've got the image now. That's lovely. Um, but you can see again, this is a very, um, this is a very, very wonderful treatment. Um, perhaps I let Bender say a little bit about the composition and so forth. Uh, there's a terrible word in art history, which is called scopophilia. Um, and it, it, it's used to describe the um, the male gaze, the aestheticizing of the male gaze over the naked female form. And uh, when I have to embark upon this, it always makes me terribly uncomfortable. But there's no denying. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> thank you, thank you for teeing me up. The, there's no denying actually that this is um, this is a really a beautiful depiction of of a naked uh, Venus. Um, and I came across, actually, I was reading in, in, the, in the, the Grove Dictionary of Art, which is you know, that's kind of the mainstay, one of the, the foundational texts of, 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 for art history students. Um, and in the entry for Artemisia, um, it does mention, it says, um, it says the, it rather pejoratively, it says, the heavy build of her figures and the occasional compositional awkwardness display her lack of conventional training. Now, um, I think what's so interesting about um, Artemisia's nudes like this um, is that they are so different, and that 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 as we've the two pictures we've discussed before, they're so different in their approach. Um, you know, uh, we may uh, we may be able to imagine in our minds that one of the, for example, uh, the famous Titian Venus of Urbino, when there's a there's a sort of gym thin uh, Venus lying naked there, um, uh, looking slightly unconvincing, and and these these are works by artists who have have been allowed into the academies, have studied uh, drawing from life of sort of um, often from classical statues. So, so very idealized bodies, not necessarily very convincing or realistic. Uh, and, and here, I think what's so interesting about Artemisia, as with a number of her news that Catherine mentioned, um, she, she's, she becomes quite famous for and quite in demand for subjects like Danii and Bathsheba. Um, this one is, is a, very obviously a real woman. Um, and I think it's it's no less powerful for that. And it, but because because art history has for so long been the the domain of men, you can see how somebody uh, who is used to a sort of Raphaelesque 
uh, classical beauty when they when they see a naked Venus might look at Artemisia's Venus here and say, oh, rather large hips, um, not quite right, uh, terrible lack of formal training. And, and it is true that Artemisia was not able to do that, that formal training. But in fact, I think that, that makes her pictures all the more convincing and successful because she had to just learn from herself and, and her maybe her female friends or um, she, she, she wasn't sort of shoehorned into that slightly artificial style. And, and that's what I think we see so successfully here. Later when um, it was more common to learn through the academies rather than as an apprentice, uh, women artists weren't allowed to sit in on, on the new drawing classes and things. And they, they're, they, there's writing about how they felt that they suffered for that, that they weren't getting the practice that they needed. Mm -hmm. And I know Catherine, you've spoken before about um, how challenging it was for her to to find models. Can you talk a bit about that? So you were well, talking about being chased. She, Surely that's not allowed. <laughs> well, she's she's kind of. It, it's funny because she. I mean, th this work is in is is really in demand from her patrons. I mean, particularly once she it, it once um you know she's established in Naples after about 1630, she has her own workshop. More people want these. Um, then she can supply. And she she's a very, very shrewd businesswoman, um, you know, marketing her work, sending work out. And she complains that finding models um, is very expensive. And I don't know whether that's because the models are <laughs> overcharging her or what. She says, oh, oh, it's a big headache. When I find good ones, they fleece me. And at other times, one must suffer their pettiness with the patience of Job. So she's really saying, God, models, such a nightmare. I, I can imagine yeah. it like you really, like, I love that letter because it really brings to life those sort of little tensions in the workplace and everybody's not really getting on with each other. And somebody wants a pay rise and you're the boss and you're trying to manage money. You're trying to manage your demanding client who wants a discount which you suspect is you know because you're a woman he thinks he can get a cheaper price and she's she's fighting off all these people and negotiating very very hard on the one hand to um, not be ripped off by the models who are cheating her and on the other hand not be ripped off by the clients who think that they can in what well in one case she has a client who gets her drawings on spec has a look and then hires a man to paint them more cheaply which she's extremely offended by, and quite rightly so. But yeah, um, you yeah. know, this is the the living reality of trying to make a career out of um, being a professional painter. It isn't always easy. So I think uh, because we're coming into the last few minutes here before um, when we've got some good questions lined up, um, it might be good. We didn't get to go through the whole list of things that we said we might cover, but that's fine. Um, what do you think her legacy has been? Certainly in the decades immediately after she died and then up to the present day, how that might be changing. Um, anyone happy, to, free to go go first on that? Catherine, maybe you could start. Well, I mean, I think she is, she is somebody who I suppose stands in quite a long tradition of women in the visual arts. Um, and we've started to, we've just started kind of to put some of these women back into art history over the past few decades. So going back into the 16th century to women like um, Sofonisba Anguissola, um, to Lavinia Fontana, both of who made very significant careers as portraitists, um, Platina Nelli, whose Last Supper has quite recently been um, uncovered in Florence and is now on display. Um, but I think what she does is that she sort of takes um, being a woman artist onto a sort of a whole different level. And she says it is possible to sort of be the boss of your own workshop and work on equal terms with men and run a business and actually be you know, really in that top tier. And I think, you know, for quite a, for, for quite a long time, once, um, you know, when, when we skip on and get to the point of professional art history getting going, um, in the late 19th century, you know, when, when the canon is established, she's really sort of fairly minor in it, except as a novelty. And gradually she has been put back to what I think is her rightful place um, in that top tier. Uh, but it's taken a very, very long time, a great amount of determined effort on the part of multiple scholars mm. to dig out all the documents, work through all the details, try to piece together, um, you know, which works are hers, um, finding the documents and so forth and and yeah so I, I think the, the legacy immediately that is in the 17th century is that a woman can do this um 
and in the longer term i think it's about trying to recover her place um in terms of her significance in the art world and then you mentioned her kind of maybe picking up the baton from caravaggio already um what what's your kind of feeling about how things have evolved her, her legacy well I, I brought actually two visual aids uh, for this so the first i have is um, this is E.H. Gombrich's Story of Art. Ah. Now, any art history students mm. among there will know about this. And as it says on the front here in, my, in the sticker, five million copies sold. And I bought this probably about 20 years ago, so maybe even six million now. Um, and there's only this is a, this is supposed to be the survey book of of art like, in the world. And there's only there's only one woman mentioned in this. Um, one woman. It's extraordinary. Um, and yet my second visual aid. And it's not Artemisia. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. No, it's not Artemisia. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Kath Colvitz, I think. My second visual aid is this. This is Chris Petty's Dictionary of Women Artists. Now, there are 21,000 women in here who were working as artists. Now, and so that just gives you an idea of how uh, absurd it is that someone like Caravaggio, uh, sorry, <laughs> that someone like yeah. Artemisia Gentileschi got, got left out of the earth because she, she was so good perfecting. Um, uh, so so many different uh, styles as well. Uh, the 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 names that um, <clears throat> sorry the names of of other female artists because Artemisia wasn't the first, but the names that Kath, uh, Catherine also mentioned uh, like Sophonis but Anguissola, uh, they they tended to focus on the, the 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 genres of art that it was more accepted for them to do. So portraiture, still life, for example, where Artemisia is so interesting and innovative is that she um, takes on those big history subjects, the big biblical subjects, and no one had ever done that before. Uh, and we've gone from the period of, of Artemisia being entirely forgotten in our history. We, we, we are going through, I think we've been through the moment where uh, we see her, um, her life story mentioned sort of almost entirely through um, the, the story of her, her rape and subsequent um, reaction to that. And I think we're now moving through to, to I think, the, the, the more, um, the, the best uh, analysis of her legacy, which is that she's the first woman in art history to give us a, a female take on, on the major pictorial subjects of her day. Um, and that is uh, something that we should, we should cherish and celebrate. And the most exciting thing, I think, is that because she was forgotten for so long, there is so much more to find out about her. We're finding new works all the time and, and new letters and it's just going to get more and more exciting. So in, in answering that question, you both have already touched on a couple of the questions I'm seeing coming through, which is um, asking who else, who else, what other women were around um, at this time? So we've mentioned a couple, I don't know if you wanted to touch on any others or if I should perhaps move on to a different um, sort of question um, in terms of um, Dzelecki's contemporaries who, who was around well, yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple of, there are a number of creative women around in Rome at the time, including um, an architect, Plate Labricci. Um, there are women working across the visual arts. So, for example, um, and, and, and the arts more generally. So one of the prominent women who's a contemporary of Artemisia's in Venice is a woman called Arcangela Terabotti, who is very, very famous for writing a virulent attack on the enclosure of unwilling women women in convents. So this is very common in Venice in this period that women whose families could not afford a dowry for them to marry get pushed into living in convents. Uh, Tarabotti hated this and she wrote a very, very lively um, treatise on just how dreadful this was. And um, she's kind of more famous one, but there's a whole um, literary culture of women writing at this time. And um, some of Artemisia's history paintings actually draw on um, theatrical works um by women um so there are there are there are actresses like um isabella andreini um there are women in the opera and um, you start to get um the first women on stage in venice in the early 17th century singing in monteverdi's operas for example so this this is a very, very lively time for women across the, vi the visual arts and across literature in music. Um, so yeah, she's she's out there, but she's certainly not on her own. She's one of a, a whole um, group of people. Um, 
and um, sorry, I had a question queued up. Oh, someone managed to see the National Gallery's Artemisia exhibition, which good on you. Um, and such a shame that, um, it, you know, it's, it's not as many people will have seen it than, than um, it, it could have been in other circumstances. But they said that they noticed that there are quite a few maids in her paintings. And they wondered if we had any thoughts about that in terms of um, her trying to surface women who are often overlooked in society at that time, or if there might be some kind of feminist angle as to why she does that. And you've already mentioned a bit about how the maid is getting in on the killing action uh, in the Hall of Furnace painting. So what, what are our thoughts there? Well, uh, very sadly, I didn't get to go around the exhibition. Um, and I, I, I really, I've been so looking forward to it, um, and this this cursed pandemic uh, got in the way. Um, and I'm afraid to say that I, so I wouldn't have been able to go around. I wouldn't have been able to make um, that conclusion. I don't have anything further to add about the, the maids, other than um, what we already mentioned in the uh, the, the enhanced role of, of Abra in the Judith and Holofernes uh, pictures, which which is of course is a subject um, that uh, Artemisia paints, I think, six or seven times, and the maid is always there. Um, playing, a, playing a central role. I think this perhaps comes back to, you know, being a woman in the period, part of your job is running the household. That's mm -hmm. the traditional woman's role. And if you are running the household, you will know, um, particularly in this period before labour saving devices, how important it is to have competent women around you in that kind of middle class household to do some of the cooking, to do the laundry to look after your multiple children while you were trying to do your art. So I suspect that just by virtue of her gender, Artemis is perhaps that little bit more aware of how necessary it is to have other women around you um, sharing that labour um, yeah. than, you know, a male artist of the period who was relying on, um, you know, his wife to, you know, take care of things might have, might, might not have, thought about it just quite so much as the woman who knows that this is meant to be her job. You, we mentioned, um, gosh, it's Elisabetta Serrani. Um, we, we didn't mention her, but she was painting around the same time. And she's an interesting story in terms of someone who was a breadwinner. She was an artist and a breadwinner and her husband took that role of kind of looking after um, maybe more of the domestic side of things, which is really interesting. It just came to mind as you, um, mention that in terms of flipping traditional roles, if you want to call it that. Um, someone has asked, have things really changed for female artists? Um, I think I'm thinking of the work of um, the Gorilla Girls and their comments on the art scene today. So are things actually that much better? Oh, silent. Uh, <laughs> well, you probably need to ask some women artists, but I mean, I, I guess certainly in theory, the possibility, you, you know, there's a sort of equal access to art school and so forth. But, um, you know, I think there is, yeah, I mean, right up and down, if you look at the kind of, the, the work of um, the kind of avant-garde feminist artists in the 1970s, they're still very much kind of challenging that notion of what a woman's proper role is. I mean, even today, if you look at, I mean, I, I've never personally done the numbers of how many of the works of art is someone like the National Gallery by men and how many are by women, but it's certainly, it's not very even proportions. It's not very even proportions in the sort of the canon of Western like art. Oh, no, I was going to say a number, but I don't want to be wrong. Um, I think we're, we're, it's, under, yeah. Yeah, we're decidedly under 50, so. very much so under 50. Uh, but I don't know if it's like close to 10 or if it's closer to 50. But yeah, proportionately, not as many women. Yeah. 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 I mean, the thing that strikes me from the life story, actually, that is that comes across as sadly very, very similar is the questions that Asmissia gets asked about the rape, which is you used to sleep around, didn't you? And all, and that, that kind of allegation is still very, very commonly um, made in, in um, decisions to prosecute or not prosecute today. And I mean, that's uh, like astonishing to me that 400 years on, we haven't made, you know, progress on those questions in, um, in, in how, um, you know, courts, courts make their decisions. And th th that's, that's the modern, the sad modern parallel that strikes me. So uh, we've got literally a minute left on our time. Um, I wanted to just 
throw to you guys to see if there's anything that you, you're like, ah, we didn't get to cover it. Uh, and you were dying to say regarding Gentileski. Um, just, I just, I, I always beseech people to keep their eyes peeled because her, uh, her, her oeuvre of known and accepted works at the moment, um, I think is not much more than 60. And if you consider that she was a professional artist from more or less the age of 17 until we don't know quite when she died, but uh, you know, many decades of professional artistry, um, that seems a, an ob almost absurdly low number of works, uh, given how successful we know she was and how celebrated we know she was in her lifetime. So keep your eyes peeled, in particular for her portraits. Um, we have one or two examples of her commission portraits. Uh, we know she did them. Um, there's one lovely one of a lady with a fan, and it's quite unlike any portrait of a lady paint that a male artist would have painted uh, for the period. She looks like she's swanning into the canvas with some real um, disco fever beats <laughs> accompanying her. It's so full of attitude. It's fantastic. And we know that when she was in London briefly, she also painted portraits of, of English people here. So um, everybody must get out there and, and keep looking. We'll find more stuff. And when I next get back to yeah. no, just I was when I when I next get back to Italy, I shall start going through those antique shops, <laughs> diving through, looking for lost. Yeah. That, that's a whole Britain's Lost Masterpieces series for you there, looking for the, mm -hmm. the hidden Gentileschi's across the nation. Well, thank you both so much for your time today and for this great discussion. There's um, so much more that can can be gone into. So I hope that curious minds out there will do some digging around and, and learning more for themselves. And thanks to the British Library as well and his best.